I'm fascinated with uh, Thomas Willis, and I would like to uh, talk to you about Willis uh, because he is not only founder of clinical um, uh, neurology, but he's also founder of uh, comparative anatomy. And um, I teach second year medical students, and um, I have to go through the nomenclature with them when I start my sessions. And it turns out that uh, uh, the contemporary nomenclature is also coming from Willis. And uh, for me, Willis is a fascinating figure because he is showing how you can combine uh, clinical practice uh, with teaching, with research, publishing. And um, I think his life is still uh, relevant for us uh, even today. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, show you the, some of these uh, slides. So I have to start by uh, saying thanks to uh, my colleagues who actually uh, arranged the birthday party for, for Willis this uh, year. This was on the 11th of January, uh, 400 years ago. So the birthday party was going on in, in, in January. And Talitha and Petra, uh, they uh, left an online legacy with these resources. So if you are interested in more in the details, then please visit the DPEG website uh, or the St. John's College uh, online exhibition on Thomas Willis. And of course, I'm also extremely grateful for Nick, who has been uh, revolutionizing this meeting over the years, and, let's, and, and also he helped us to celebrate Willis's birthday. So thank you, Nick, for all your efforts uh, over the years. So we had a birthday drinks on the 27th of January, and I just want to point out a couple of uh, colleagues who participated in these birthday drinks. Uh, Professor Trevor Hughes is a world expert on Willis and his book is, is very famous. Uh, Professor Alastair Comston's book is coming out on Willis this September. And uh, we also mentioned uh, Mr. Adams uh, when um, Arjun discussed the hemispherectomy. So he's a very distinguished neurosurgeon. And I will uh, play some clips from some of these interviews for you. And I also am very grateful to Masood Hussain, who is the editor of chief of Brain, who also commissioned an article which you can access uh, uh, through Brain on, on Willis. So Willis was born in Great Bedwin, uh, which is next to Marlborough in Wiltshire. And uh, uh, his father was running a farm here. Um, uh, farms were owned by St. John's, my own college. So there is a link already uh, between Oxford. And if you look at this old map, and then you superimpose the Google map of, um, of Great Bedwin, you see that this, this place didn't really change. You can still find uh, Farm Lane. And from Farm Lane, you have the house where Willis was born in Ivy Cottage. Willis is two years old when uh, Rachel, mom, is inheriting land in North Hinksey, which is about two uh, miles from Oxford. Uh, and this is the house where they moved into it's uh, uh, owned by St. Cross College. And uh, uh, this is where he was growing up, but he is only 10 years old when um, uh, mom dies and uh, uh, the uh, father has to remarry a, a widow to, to keep the family together and uh, uh, keep going. Mom is uh, buried here in St. Lawrence's church and, and subsequently also the father. And, and this is from where uh, Willis had to go to school to Oxford. So it's quite a distance. So he must have been in a good um, uh, condition. So the, the school he went to was at High Street and he received an extremely good um, education in Latin, uh, Greek, logic, rhetorics. And this really prepared Willis to matriculate at Christ Church at the age of 16. So he uh, uh, had to pay uh, he had to serve to pay his tuition, and he was allocated to Dr. Ives, the dean of the college. And this was actually an amazing coincidence because um, Mrs. Ives was preparing uh, all sorts of um, medications and was very interested in medicine, and probably this contributed um, uh, to the change of his uh, career. So he initially wanted to study theology, but then he switched to medicine. So he was all set to make progress. And this is the time when Oxford is already uh, uh, shaping up. And uh, you see the outline of Oxford. Uh, um, 
and uh, lots of colleges were established uh, around this time and they already um, have about 400 students uh, in Oxford at, at this uh, time. However, uh, the civil war broke out and this had a huge impact on Willis's career and uh, um, his uh, studies were completely disrupted and you will see that there was some, actually some advantage uh, from this uh, uh, because he didn't have to go through um, the medical school, which was actually detrimental for his uh, thinking, it would have been detrimental. So Oxford became a garrison town. The queen and king, uh, um, they resided in Oxford. And also you had the sieges of Oxford by the rebel uh, Cromwell forces who also fired a cannonball into my own college at St. John's, uh, which we kept in the, the library. So this was not the time of studying, uh, but nevertheless, uh, he got his degree uh, in 1646 uh, from the king because he was loyal uh, uh, to the crown. Uh, and this was just before uh, Charles I was uh, killed and uh, Cromwell uh, took over. And uh, when the um, protectorate finished, then Willis again was rewarded in 1660 by getting his MD degree from Charles II. So his career was really shaped by the civil war and uh, it was a huge advantage that he could practice. And this is very unusual that somebody could uh, actually base his, uh, his um, scientific knowledge on first-hand experience. His career took off he, he produced all these books, which I outlined here in, in purple. After the Great Fire of London, he moved to London, uh, but he, his most productive years were in, uh, uh, here in Oxford. So uh, historians, uh, they think that this was actually very unusual that he could base his um, views on his own oh. observations. I am talking to Erica Charters about this. To me, what's interesting about Willis is on the one hand, he's this traditional conservative, pious Anglican who remains an Anglican throughout, who then of course gets rewarded with the restoration in the 1660s with this position, partly because he's been so steadfast and loyal, but he's also practicing things which at the time would have been seen as rather unusual, right? Empirical practices, being an empiric, those are problematic, if not dirty words. Um, especially for, for men who are, who are trained in a kind of more traditional academic, scholastic tradition. So it's better not to have an education than to have the wrong kind of an education. So Willis avoided that and he started practicing. And we know a bit about his, uh, uh, the history of his uh, early years as a doctor from Kenneth uh, Drewhorse's book. Uh, where he published the uh, cases. He uh, uh, probably Willis did not intend to publish this, but from this book, we know where he practiced in this 50 uh, miles radius across Oxford. And uh, we know uh, that he went to Abingdon in, in, in the surrounding villages. He shared horse with his, his friends. And we also know the cases uh, he looked at, and he also know how much he charged for his patients for all this. And I asked um, um, Kevin Talbot to talk a bit more about this. If you read uh, Willis's account of the patients he saw early in his career, at least, there is a certain uh, similarity to the way that we think, which strikes me as very modern. And I think this is one of his great legacies. I mean, every medical student will, of course, know about the circle of Willis, but what they don't realize is the extent to which the way that he uh, wrote about medicine and the way that he took his observations and the curiosity about the fundamental correlation with anatomy was something new at the time. And actually we have a tremendous legacy of that. And if you look at the diseases uh, Willis described, it's just phenomenal and the details. For instance, he, he produced the whale bone for one of the patients who had achalasia of the cardia just to push down the food uh, or he is describing the, the symptoms of myasthenia gravis in great detail. Or he described a case of a couple where when the husband wanted to talk to the wife who had uh, hearing loss, um, he employed a servant to play on the drum. Uh, 
And by producing this extra noise, uh, uh, he could uh, converse with the wife, but not after the drumming finished. And there are many other very, very interesting cases which he is describing. He described malaria, other um, uh, fevers, and even the restless leg syndrome. So he was a very modern uh, uh, doctor. What I see in front of me is somebody who's fundamentally curious, somebody who is simply not uh, coming to the patient with a set of dogmas, somebody who wishes to explore and understand what's going on. In that sense, he's a very modern thinker. And his legacy is still with us. Now we do medicine as, as, as Willis was, was uh, doing medicine, but this was absolutely not the case. He was also working in a team and this team was extremely distinguished. So it contained uh, Christopher Wren, Richard Lauer, Millington, Boyle, and also Patty. So uh, Patty was the Tomlin's reader of anatomy, a position which is still associated to Christchurch uh, College today. And he had access to uh, cadavers to do dissections. And they did phenomenal uh, number of dissections uh, with Patty. And they didn't have have an anatomy incident that they did in Patty's uh, um, uh, residence at uh, Barclay Hall. And, um, and Willis uh, was doing it uh, together with Patty. And Willis was uh, um, struggling as a young doctor, but then his fortune took off after this uh, incident, which happened on 14th of December in 1650. Uh, they hanged Anne Green. Uh, under an act uh, which suggested that uh, there was a legal presumption that a woman who concealed the death of her illegitimate child had murdered it. And um, Anne Green's body was uh, delivered to Patty and uh, Willis. And then uh, she was basically uh, resurrected. First, the, um, uh, the soldier started stamping at her chest when she vocalized and and probably this is the best resuscitation method you can do. And then Willis and Patty let some blood out, uh, pushed the feather down the throat, uh, gave some hot cordial, put her in bed with another woman to warm her up. And then uh, she completely recovered and even took the coffin with her to show it to the friends and relatives. So after this, Willis and Patty produced this flyer and they distributed it to patients. And after this, they could charge anything because they, they were so famous, they could um, resurrect. So this happened off High Street. Uh, it's very difficult to find this street, but I'll show you how to do it. So you face Carfax and then you turn to the right. At the sign of Chiang Mai Kitchen. So this is an excellent uh, Thai restaurant, which I really recommend. And uh, this is the site where this resurrection happened. And uh, it's interesting to think about it, how, how in those days uh, science was conducted in these buildings. Uh, and uh, according to uh, Alastair Buchan, who is the professor of stroke medicine, Willis was the first who uh, discovered neuroprotection. He really discovered neuroprotection. And I, when, I, when I talk about neuroprotection and we talk about all of the glutamate antagonists and all the ways we've got, of changing excitotoxicity in the nervous system. Actually, if you go back to Anne Green, a poor, young, uh, thin, probably uh, hypoglycemic, certainly hypothermic uh, young girl that was resuscitated after a failed uh, hanging at Carfax, she was resuscitated successfully despite the, the duration of time when she probably had had some kind of cessation of cerebral perfusion. But the reason she recovered was, of course, what we now understand to be very, very um, key to the physiological protection of the brain, dropping glucose, dropping temperature, working with, with young subjects. And this is, of course, what we've discovered from the animal models of resuscitation 400 years later. Mm -hmm. Willis probably was the first person to, to do an effective resuscitation unwittingly, but he was also actually the first person to describe, I suspect, how those physiological conditions allowed the brain to recover. Willis did not discover the mTOR pathway though, so uh, there's quite a bit of progress uh, since then. And I think the success why, why Willis was so uh, productive is because he was working in this team. And if you look at these names, uh, they 
contributed to chemistry and many other disciplines, uh, blood transfusion. And, and uh, this, um, uh, for instance, they used port and vinegar to conserve some of the brains. And this was the idea of Robert Boyle, uh, the chemist. And, um, and this teamwork shows uh, in the, in the uh, publications of, of, uh, of uh, Willis. If you are interested in this period, I really recommend Ian Pierce's Instance of the Finger Post book, which is a masterpiece, my, my favorite book ever. And, um, and Ian is uh, historically accurate. So he has some fictitious characters, but also uh, based on reality. And uh, um, uh, Ian also read Anthony Wood's uh, um, publications on this period. And according to Ian, the civil war had a huge effect on religion, politics, and science. And um, he believed that all these extremely talented uh, students, lecturers, and doctors, they were stuck in Oxford. They couldn't get a job in, in uh, other places, so they were unemployed. And then they turned their attention to some of these huge questions. So um, Ian is explaining this period to us now. You always tend to see it as off with the old, on with the new, you know, a revolution casting out all this old knowledge and, and new dawn. Um, but of course, it wasn't like that. I mean, it, it grew in, in new ways of thinking, it grew inside the old ways of thinking. Um, similarly, there was no problem between science and religion. That was a sort of 19th century invention. So there was a real intellectual uh, ferment. And this intellectual ferment uh, led uh, to the establishment of the Royal Society. Um, so if you look at these names, it's really humbling uh, to see uh, uh, just how intellectual power was concentrating in Oxford uh, during these turbulent times. Now Willis uh, then moved to Merton Street, uh, opposite uh, Merton's lodging. And um, he still debated whether he lived in number three or number and, and worked in number four. But nevertheless, these two buildings are connected to one another. Now they are owned by Corpus Christi College. And he had an extremely uh, productive time here. Uh, this um, uh, building is called Beam Hall, but the official name is really Beham Hall after Gilbert de Beham, who was the ninth chancellor of Oxford University. Now the name uh, Beam came uh, from these um, uh, wooden beams you can see inside the building. And uh, it was also called Aula Trabina. Trabina means uh, made of wood. And uh, you can see that this is really a characteristic feature of this building. So this nickname, a beam, uh, probably was sticking uh, uh, quite well. So it's really humbling to see these rooms, probably not a lot changed since uh, Willis was resident here. And um, he, he uh, uh, published uh, uh, some very famous books and probably the word neurology comes from these, this uh, building. So his first um, publications were on uh, fevers and uh, metabolism. And then his second uh, book was on cerebri anatomy. And this is uh, uh, where he uh, used the word neurology first. So Kristalina Antoinides will explain it to us. Thomas Willis can claim to be the father of neurology, and that is essentially the study of um, and treatment of the nervous system. And Willis was a fine anatomist. Uh, he celebrated, he was celebrated for his dissections of the brain and of the cranial and spinal nerves. And his writings, in fact, which include the first use of the word neurology itself, um, you can sort of trace it back to the Oxford English Dictionary, which records actually Willis as uh, the first person to have used the word neurology in print. He also, this is the, the book where he describes uh, the uh, arterial circle. So the two internal carotid and two vertebral arteries, they meet and they have the anterior, middle and posterior cerebral arteries. And also he is giving great credit, credit to Richard Lauer and Christopher Wren, uh, Lauer for the dissections and Wren for the illustrations. So it was a teamwork. As you know, Wren also responsible for the architecture of the All Souls College and also the Sheldonian uh, Theater. 
and also he um, uh, was involved in, in uh, the rebuilding of London after the Great Fire, and he is the architect of the St. Paul's Cathedral. Willis wasn't the first to describe the arteriosus circle. Uh, Fallopius described it before him. Uh, Caserius uh, even produced some excellent drawings. Uh, uh, they look a bit more hairy than Wren's drawings, but you can clearly see the arteriosus circle. And um, it wasn't uh, Willis who described the first functional implications either. It was Johann Jacob Wepfer in Switzerland who described uh, the ring of arteries, which he termed continuous duct. But nevertheless, the circle of Willis uh, stuck because of the uh, excellent illustrations and also the very clear description uh, of this arteriosus circle. Um, this is still anatomically accurate, although there are some uh, issues which I could point out for some of the experts which are inaccurate in these drawings. But since it's a birthday party, I don't want to, to ruin it with these um, anomalies which, which one could detect. So Willis described the case of a patient who had a stomach cancer but, and had an almost com completely occluded right heart. Um, and, and then he's describing that nature had provided a sufficient remedy against the risk of apoplexy. As you can, uh, you could uh, hear some of these uh, earlier talks today uh, with the hemispherectomy uh, and, uh, and no, no development of the whole hemisphere. You can see that this circle is not always working and there is a huge anatomical variation which Ashok Honda studied uh, here in Oxford and uh, there is a recent publication on this variability. So it's not present in everybody and if you perform endarterectomy you need to know these variations uh, before you start doing the surgery. Willis also contributed to the nomenclature of the cranial nerves. Before him, Galenus described seven pairs. Uh, Vesalius extended this. So these are, this is the nomenclature uh, Vesalius used, and this is the, what we use today. And as you can see, Willis identified all of the cranial nerves, but he put the facial and the vestibulocochlear together and the glossopharyngeal vagus and accessory in one nerve. And then he confused the glossopharyngeal with some of the hypoglossal. But nevertheless, if you, if you have a look at the drawings, he had all these nerves together. The final numbering was actually established by uh, Sommering as a medical student in uh, Göttingen. And now we use this uh, nomenclature. In the uh, pathology cerebri, he uh, clearly uh, described the symptoms of epilepsy, as Arjun mentioned in his talk. And uh, in his next book, he uh, identified the cause of hysteria as, as the brain and, and not other body parts, which was extremely progressive. And um, his writing is phenomenal. And Alastair is going to explain this to us in a bit more detail. Hardly a page goes by without an observation which resonates with the symptoms, signs, and mechanisms of disease that would be encountered by any physician, neurologist, gastroenterologist, respiratory physician working in any one of the last four centuries. So Willis had an amazing legacy. And if you look at some of these illustrations, for instance, here, the autonomic nervous system, you can see the recurrent laryngeal nerves, the right, uh, right left differences, which we terrorize medical students when uh, in anatomy tutorial and many other details, which, it's, which you could use these um, uh, drawings even for teaching today. He used slightly different nomenclature. He used the sympathetic paravertebral ganglionic chain as intercostal nerves. Uh, obviously it changed the name, but uh, otherwise this drawing could be used today to teach uh, the autonomic nervous system. Now, uh, Willis published everything in Latin and uh, the English nomenclature um, is actually hindered uh, the progress because it was uh, because the English nomenclature was never really uh, accepted. And then uh, uh, what was called uh, grand sympathicus, like uh, you know, uh, we use completely different terminology today. But Willis was one of the, uh, his said intercostal nerve, nervous intercostalis, but it is not the same as today. It was uh, a large sympathetic trap. So it... And also some of this nomenclature we still use today. Uh, uh, so I just made a list of these. Uh, 
um, which is coming uh, from, uh, uh, from Willis. So when you teach anatomy to the second year students and they ask you about the origin of these terms, I just usually refer them to uh, Willis and, uh, and this is still with us today. So his contribution was enormous. Uh, so what was his legacy? So the last two minutes, I just want to show you what is it that he, he is really famous for. Now, I mean, obviously, if you ask what is his fundamental contribution uh, to neurological knowledge, um, obviously he's best known and best remembered for describing the, the arterial arrangement at the base of the brain, uh, the self of Willis. But I don't think that is actually his main contribution. And in line with this uh, interest in movement, to, to my mind, the greater contribution is the distinction he made between voluntary and what he called reflective, or we might call involuntary movement. And this is really the concept of the reflex. Uh, and he was very much concerned with those parts of the nervous system, which are primarily concerned with what we might now call vegetative functions. In other words, really the first articulation of the autonomic nervous system. And he compared the nervous systems of many different organisms, vertebrate, invertebrates, and by comparing uh, the brains of a sheep and a human, he concluded that the cerebrum is the primary seat of the rational soul in man and the sensitive soul in animals is the source of movement and ideas. And when he described this boy who was suffering from epilepsy and learning disabilities here on the right, and he linked the cortical developmental abnormality to cognitive dysfunction. So for me, that's one of the greatest legacy of, of uh, Willis. He published a lot on, uh, on uh, and that was probably not um, stood the time. Uh, and it is relevant for us today that he already published on the plague and uh, he identified two treatments. First of all, you have to treat the spreading of the disease, and then you have to treat actually the, the patients themselves. And in this book, he described the two separate treatments which are needed. He was extremely good in uh, corresponding with his colleagues. And uh, with Trevor Hughes, we looked at his original letters at St. John's uh, Library, uh, where he's exchanging ideas about how to treat the patients uh, in, in detail. And, and, he was, and he was a superb, um, a superb doctor. And so uh, what is he uh, leaving us with us today? So I see his work on the mind, um, the uh, corporeal uh, and the rational cells as an extension of his basic idea about movement, voluntary and involuntary. That, to my mind, is really what he's left us with. And he also left us with a historical puzzle, how to look at Willis today. Willis is such a fascinating figure because it's not obvious at the time that people are going to place him as someone who's an innovator, right? And I think there's been a lot of debate among historians about how to see him. Should we see him as being the forerunner of how we now understand neuroanatomy? Should we, what happens when we think about it in his perspective, which of course is within a very, in some ways, almost traditional religious framework of trying to understand the soul and trying to understand how the function of the body works and how it relates to anatomy. So I think he's a, he's such a um, fascinating figure because he forces us to really question our assumptions about what's innovation. What do we think of as being novel thoughts and novel approaches? So on his 400th birthday, I think uh, we all have our opinion about his work, but he, for me, he's really the founder of clinical uh, neurology.